Good morning. Good morning. You have more energy this week, this month, than I do. That's not because I better do. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to meeting number 281. Bill. 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 Okay. Meeting number 281. It's September, right? Uh, it it up. Last time I checked. It's a Saturday? Okay, then I'm good. Um, let's start out with news. Anybody have some items they want to share with the club membership? Going once, going twice. Ah! Shauna Collins. There's an Apple announcement on the 12th. Okay. About what? We don't know. Their normal Probably. fall September announcement. Yeah. Like oh. it's the yeah. So, true to form, they always do their announcements after we've had our meeting in September. <laughs> so, in October, what we might be doing at that one is talking about the new operating systems that are coming out and the new machines that have uh, been released, etc. If what they announce on uh, the 12th is not very awe-inspiring, get my little thing up here in front of me. I must know all the beep boops up here. You can't hear it, but I can. Or distracting. Um, if they don't do any major, major announcements and there really isn't anything to show in October as to new operating systems, then we'll go with uh, the other thing we were going to do in November, which would be holiday movies using Clips and iMovie. So we'll let you know. One, one way or another, they'll be worth coming to the meeting. Um, how many of you use Evernote? Okay. I've got it. The Evernote company is experiencing challenges in that their subscriber rate has been flat the last two years, and significant leadership has left the company to go somewhere else. So I would recommend, along with a bunch of other bloggers, that you, if you're using Evernote, you probably want to export your data into another platform just in case they do go under. Because if they go under, you still have your data on your local machine, but uh, if you've got stuff that's in process and sale, it may not be accessible to you. Um, the easiest way that I've found to migrate from Evernote and you, you could probably laugh at me, but I'm using Apple Notes, the one that's built into iOS and into Mac OS. And all you do is you select those notebooks in Evernote, and you say you want to export them. That creates a file. I typically save them on my desktop so I can find them. And then you tell Apple Notes to import. It'll bring them into a folder it creates called imported notes and then one at a time you have to do the sorting because Apple Notes doesn't have the hierarchical structure that Evernote has. Okay. So that's just something to be aware of. If you're using Evernote, yes, Don? Do you have any good alternatives to Evernote besides notes? Um, Simple Note is a pretty good one. Um, it, it all depends on what you're doing. If you're just taking notes, using like the equivalent of sticky notes or 3 by 5 index cards, simple notes will get you there. If you're able to uh, stand the interface of Microsoft OneNote, I mean, it's a really, really cluttered, busy <coughs> interface, uh, that might be a better choice for you because you can keep that higher optical structure, having a notebook, and then within the notebook there's sub-notes or sub-categories of notes. So Microsoft OneNote would be the other one. 
And I don't think Microsoft's going to go away in the next six months. I think they're, they're probably safe and secure for maybe eight months, maybe not. Okay. I think it's smart to be I'm not predicting Microsoft is going to go under. Um, other little pieces of information. There was a company that quite a few of our members was using down at Austin Landing called Experimac. They closed their doors over the summer and uh, haven't had much contact with them since then, but uh, you know, they're no longer down there. <coughs> there are other uh, operations other than Apple in the area. Uh, Gem Digital is one that comes to mind, Eric the Green. Uh, there's Blue Sky, uh, DNA, which is over in Kettering. So there's other places that will do that kind of repair work. And microcomputer down in Cincinnati on Moscow, which is one of my favorites. Bill, yes. Would you put that list of places on the web and so we can look it up? Does that make sound like a good idea, Mr. Webmaster? You, you give me the list, I'll update our website. <coughs> okay. Uh, we do have a resources page that those that can be listed. Okay. We can do that. And we'll maybe make a new one and call it local resources. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we could show up, and if they don't throw us out, we'll put them on the list as local resources. <laughs> okay, let's see. Anybody else have anything? Going once, going twice? Uh, you probably have heard about the various problems with Flash, the various problems with Java, uh, the problems that Apple has had with some of their top-rated apps that apparently were actually uh, adware collecting all sorts of information that they weren't supposed to be collecting. I, I just have to chuckle at that, because the one that was the worst offender was an anti-adware. Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah. It's like, oh, anti. they got you. Um, something else, I just oh, want to yeah. make sure that I repeat this. I'm going to do this every month. There is a company called Mac Keeper. Okay. And they have various names they operate under. And I've seen them popping up on Facebook. You know, these things, you know, you don't have to clean your Mac manually. You can automate it, blah, blah, blah. Just so I repeat this one more time, Mac Keeper from Zeobit is Mac Keeper from Zeobit. Oh. Okay, it's a Russian company. Yeah. Um, it is not a good thing to install on your computer. Uh, it allows them to remotely do stuff to your computer. They do collect marketing information about you. And it, the thing that's worst of all is it slows down your computer and screws up things basically. So don't make keeper bad. Bad, bad thing, Mac There's another company called MacPaw, and they have a product called Clean My Mac. Mm -hmm. right. What will happen is MacKeeper will have ads that look like they're from MacPaw. <coughs> okay, two different companies. One's based in the Ukraine. One's based in the Russian Federation. Again, for those of you who understand the current. Uh, political, you know, not best friends forever stuff that's going on. That's a, 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 a very volatile combination there. Uh, Clean My Mac is a, is a good product, uh, but I wouldn't buy it right now because they're just about to release their new version. And uh, it's got some really, really nice new features. Not keep her bad, Clean My Mac, Mac Ball is a good product. It's not the same as <coughs> No, App Cleaner is not a commercial product at all. It's a free one. Okay, in a recent Apple Care call I made, they were <coughs> about that person we were talking about, Matt Keeper. Yeah. They absolutely get rid of it, but they also wanted me to get rid of uh, the other app cleaner. They probably were be, problems. Probably <coughs> because there's some You've got this whole group of people on the internet who just don't want to make money the easy way, which is pick up a good product or service, charge for it, 
get happy customers, keep them happy, the money keeps flowing. Instead, they want to do it the other way. They want to con you into stuff. Okay. So, Mac Keeper typically will get installed not because someone has downloaded and installed it, but rather they wanted to print coupons. You know, you, you're looking for a coupon printer, and this other stuff gets installed. There is a uh, adware thing that looks very much, in terms of its name, is very much like App Cleaner, except instead of it being cleaner <coughs> ER on the end, it's just an R. And that one is malware. That one is adware. So, um, yeah, it's getting complicated out there. Yes? Clean My Mac has their new update out now. Okay. I'm, I'm a beta. Just disclaimer, you know, take what I say as, you know, being total fake news. <coughs> I'm a beta tester for the folks at MacPaw. I'm a beta tester for the folks at Parallels Desktop for the Mac. I'm a beta tester for Microsoft. I am not a beta tester for Apple. Okay. Though I once was an Apple developer. Okay. So if those are my, my disclosures. If anything else comes up, I'll let you know. Um, so that just came out like a day or so ago? About two or three days ago, I got an email. In fact, I was going to ask you if it was worthwhile to upgrade to the new one because the new one's 20 bucks for one machine, 20 bucks for three, I think. Yeah. Um, okay. You, you got to remember, I, I've got the, the last of the beta versions, and they just gave me a free license because I was a good beta tester and I gave them good, you know, good information. So, and I haven't installed that yet, but if it's like the beta, I really, really liked it because it could do some things the other one couldn't do. Hmm. One was, okay, now this is, take this as, write it in pencil, not in ink, okay, because <laughs> this is the, the beta version. It had a spyware adware scanner that was as good as uh, um, the other ones that I've, I've touted in the past. It had a function where it would look at the applications on your computer, and if things were out of date and there were new versions, it would update them. But it would tell you which ones were from the Apple Store and which ones were not from the Apple Store, which ones were Microsoft. I, that becomes important when you're, when you're updating stuff. Uh, what was the other? There was one other feature that I really, really liked that they had. Um, oh, and they had a thing where, now this is for Sierra and High Sierra and Mojave, <coughs> where it does um, uh, a little bit better job of optimizing stuff. Um, it, it, it just very interesting. It just I could tell the machine was running faster. I could tell that my web browsers were working better. Okay. So anyway, so I'll, uh, I'll give you more information next month once I purchase. I was uh, even though I'm a beta tester, if I really like stuff, I also buy it. So I'll probably be buying a five pack. Anyway, because I got, you know, my dad and other people that I put this on. Yes. They go. also have a one time purchase upgrade, but they don't really go into what the differences are. Yeah. So I would I would wait until they, they get, you know, do the full blown marketing. These are the new features that are in it. Uh, because I operate when I'm doing this beta testing, I'm under what's called a uh, NDA, a non disclosure agreement. Uh, there's some things I can talk about you know, as we're talking, but I can't show you, like put it up on the screen. So once they have the commercial version out there, uh, and I'll, I'll send uh, Piotr uh, a, a message and ask him if it's okay if I show my, you know, commercial version. Okay. Um, anybody else got any other news? Eileen looks so bored. I need to her up my game. Going once, going twice. I don't know how many people are still in the workforce, but if your company has like a subscription to Microsoft Office, something that would be like a corporate subscription, Microsoft does have a like a home use program <coughs> that you can basically get Office for free. 
it is very, very similar to what they do with the educational institutions. Okay, so let's say you have uh, a loved one, hypothetical situation, a loved one who works for uh, some university or school system that has a contract with Microsoft for Microsoft Office. Because you're a faculty, staff, or administrative person, you can log in with your school Microsoft ID and have it put uh, Office 2016 on your Mac or your PC. I believe there's a restriction of five machines. Well, I, I, this was a corporate license, so it wasn't a matter of logging in. It was just a matter of using uh, a corporate access point. So. Um, oh, okay, I got you. So was, they've got the enterprise license yeah. where it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So and, and then it allows you to choose between Windows or Mac versions, and they actually send you, they send it to whatever email you want. You can send it to your home directly, rather than using a work email. Yeah. So that might be something if you're interested uh, that you explore that. If you are a faculty member, I highly recommend that you go talk to Bless the you. computer department. Bless you. Not the people that are teaching computer science, but the people that are doing the computer support for your institution. Because sometimes there's all sorts of software that's available to you at little or no cost or free that can really make your lives much easier. So, for example, uh, I've got uh, people I know who are on faculty at Indiana University. They have virus scanners. They've got, they've got this wonderful little program where you launch it on your computer. It looks to see what campus you're on, and then it turns on all the printers that are available for you to use. Okay, and a little map comes up. It shows you where you are and where the printers are. So you can tell us if behind a locked door or not. And that you know, was sort of neat, I thought. Okay, um, let's move on. For sale, wanted, and freebies. Right. Uh, that's something I got there at our last meeting. Is over there. It runs DVD discs and stuff. That's okay. free. And I have an Epson printer. Okay. That I'd like to sell. Uh, it hasn't been used in the better part of this year. Okay. So I don't know about the ink, but uh, just a nice. Okay. So the and black Epson printer. printer that's sitting over there yeah. that's raised. So if you're interested in the printer, see Ray at the break. Um, Mark Georges has uh, some things on the table. I'm not sure how many of them are left. Here, use that one. I got a little story to tell. Okay. Our this is not a sad story. This is a Uplifting motivation. Granddaughter likes gears. Okay, so my wife went on to Amazon and found these. You know, they got little gears to move this, and they move. So anyway, ten dollars. So she orders orders one up. Two days later, two big boxes show up at our front door. They <laughs> sit us two dozen. Uh oh. So I uh -oh. first thing I did is check my account, make sure I didn't get charged for two dozen, which I didn't. I got charged for the one. So then I got a phone number and actually talked to somebody at Amazon to find out what I should do with all these extra ones. And after I talked to them about five or ten minutes, they said, we don't want them back. Give them out or throw them away. So if anybody, if that one gets taken and somebody wants one, let me know because I'll bring it to you. I got a great grant. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, the boxes in front of me are two external enclosures that are not populated, it doesn't have a disc in it, but uh, interested in selling, they're, they're mimicking the uh, mini platform, mini profile, um, just make me an offer, they gotta go. Okay. And then uh, the second gen Apple TV and some other goodies that are still left okay. over. Do you know what price is uh, the best offer for the Apple TV? Yeah, make me an offer, I'm, everything's gotta go. Ballpark for the enclosures. 40 bucks. Each. Yeah. Okay. I bought in a few things over there. Uh, okay. Disc Studio, uh, iMovie, booklet, uh, manual, okay. and uh, Elements 3 software. Okay. There's also, I've also got a freebie on the desk over there for uh, Corel Painter version 9. Okay. If anybody's interested. Okay. Anybody else put anything on the freebie table or bring in stuff they want to sell? 
in the most common device. Well, let me ask you, I'm, I'm going through my basement, and now that I've got everything up off the floor and it's on either tables or shelves, and there's a little more organization to it, I've discovered I have all sorts of cables. <laughs> cables. I have Ethernet cables, I have coax cables, I have uh, shortwave radio cable, I have USB cables, I've got firewire cables, I've got power cords. Is there anyone in the room that has a significant need for some sort of cable? Okay, I'm not seeing it. Is there anyone in the room that would like to have a spare cable just in case? <laughs> Firewire 800 or 4? <laughs> uh, think of the one with the small connector that goes directly into the movie camera. Oh, oh, uh, the uh, iLink. iLink <coughs> and then the other end, it's, yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. yeah, I got some of those. <laughs> okay. Yes, Decker. How about lightning cables to USB? Um, no, but. What I would recommend is uh, Tuesday morning. I know that. You know that? They have pretty good cables. The other one, the lightning cables, are good prices. The other one is Kohl's. You go back by the bathroom, they got that one electronics table up there uh, where you're going to find the Fitbits. Um, they've got some. They've got good prices on cables. You may want to make sure that it says it's MFI certified. Yeah. Because if it's not, it's a piece of junk. Probably. Yeah, the I stuff bought four of them. The stuff MFI you're going to get at Kohl's is going to be MFI certified. The stuff at Tuesday morning, not so much. The other thing, just uh, coming off the top of my head, you know, I've got this beautiful gold watch here on my wrist. This is actually a Fitbit HR2, and I took off the crappy Chinese band that was on it. And I spent five bucks on Amazon to buy one of these. And it's got a little magnet so you can adjust it to oh, your wrist nice. size. So I just thought I'd mention it. I can't tell you how many people have looked at it and gone, wow, it's even rose gold. Oh. And it's just a you know, standard Fitbit, just with a new band. So if you're using a Fitbit watch, you might want to think about you know, updating no, the band. Huh. If you've got a Fitbit that does have removable bands. Sometimes it keep the time, too. <laughs> it keeps the time. It tells me that my heart rate right now is 80 beats because I'm presenting. I've done 11 steps. I've got 199 out of 250 steps to get this half hour. And I've done a total of 5,200 steps so far today. <laughs> Start stepping and it will tell me every so often, you know, other stuff that I don't need to know. <laughs> okay. yeah. Uh, yeah, Andy. Probably going back to your cables. I yeah. do recycle a lot of the wires. Yeah. Mine is it just break down. Yeah. Okay. okay. If I do if that, that if I do that, it'll be electrical <laughs> kind of the electrical wire, uh, ten gauge and twelve gauge, fourteen gauge. Now I'm talking about your computer stuff. Oh, the little. Okay. Power cables, that's a good stuff for me, sorry. Yeah, so okay. I'm just saying I, I do that every month, so. If you get over 10,000 steps. Okay, moving right along. For that day. Any other freebies, any other wanted? Okay, help desk. Who's had problems? Okay, Ray, lead us off. I have a very old. MacBook is my briefcase here. Okay, and how old uh, is it? What year? Uh, <coughs> early 2008. Okay. And it's running uh, Lion. Uh, and I have a program on it called FileMaker Pro 9. Mm -hmm. And we were having a little problem with the computer, and I thought, uh-oh, I've got plenty of backups. Mm -hmm. But if the machine goes down, you know, what am I going to do? So uh, I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll take the entire 
database data in it and put it on an Excel sheet because it just says right here, save mm -hmm. to Excel. Mm -hmm. And then I'll let you look at it. That's the message I get. Now I'm concerned because this this I don't even own this computer. Yeah. It belongs to our alumni association. So what it basically says is that it can't open the application that would let him export this data because Power PC applications are no longer supported. Um, you're running the Lion. I would look to see if you can still put Rosetta on it, which was the little plug-in that Apple had that would let you run PowerPC applications. Ah. Okay. And I don't recall, does anybody know whether they, I know they dropped Rosetta in Mavericks and in Yosemite. I think it was still running in Lion. It may have been around Mountain Lion that they dropped its uh, ability to. Okay. Okay, so that's Rosetta. All right. Um, the other thing is, do you have uh, a newer version of, of FileMaker running on another machine? No. Okay. Lion killed Rosetta. Hmm? No. Yeah. Lion killed Rosetta. It only worked. So uh, Snow Leopard was the last one with Rosetta. Snow Leopard was the last one, and okay. Lion that killed it. Um, Guillermo. Mm -hmm. Sir. Put on your FileMaker hat for a minute. Okay. If you're running FileMaker Pro version 9, which if I recall is like circa uh, 1998, 2000? 2007. 2007. Okay. Can you think of any other ways of exporting data out? I, I think you need FileMaker 11. That's That was the key. Yeah, that allows you to transfer the format <coughs> to one that will work okay. in subsequent versions of FileMaker. The only other way I could think of is if you've got an older, older machine, like a PowerPC computer, you know, an old iBook that's got a G4 or G3 processor in it, you can yeah. probably do it on that. Okay. Assuming you've got your license and you can install that on the the older machine. I had no clue that I was running the PowerPC application. No, you're not, you're running, what you're running is an application where some of its helper applications are PowerPC. See, I inherited this thing a few years ago and we keep track of our, mm -hmm. we have close to 4,000 names in the thing. Mm -hmm. I hate to lose that. Uh, okay. But the, on the other hand, I think the whole association is going to die within the next two years. So, okay. Everybody, we're, we're down in membership terrible because they keep dying. <laughs> I've been addressed in the cemetery. <laughs> then they'll quit. <laughs> okay. Anyway, what, what I would suggest though is you might want to call the folks at FileMaker and explain that you're in a legacy. Yeah, Bill? Uh, we've been using FileMaker for years and we're up in. Um, if you want, I can install FileMaker 11 and give you a, a, a number, serial number, to install it. I was just looking to see if, what version of operating system do you have on your laptop? He's got mine, he says. I was looking to see if it's, what was the number? <coughs> I'm going to suggest you two get together at the break. Yeah. Okay. And who was the other person that spoke up? Ron Decker. Ron Decker in the back. Hello, Ron. So what? see Ron at the brand okay. and see Bill at the brand. Okay. okay. I don't have to go to him. This is also a uh, FileMaker question. Sure. But I have a day runner planner, you know, the kind that's mm -hmm. going to just simply because I don't want to have to look up him. Yeah. It's very But it's out. Day, day runner doesn't have, uh, can't, you can't print them out on Mac. You have to go back to Microsoft. In other words, it's put. Uh, it does FileMaker and you get a FileMaker and it gets um, like a day runner type uh, thing that's printed out. Okay, let, let me back up. Okay. Your day runner. Are we talking like the book? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you're looking for pages you can put into your book. Correct. Okay. 
I got the website for you because they will they'll let you print out specialized pages from their templates for the you know the small yeah. little ones yeah. and the medium size and then the one that I used to carry around that looked like you could float on it. Uh -huh. Yeah. So um, at probably not uh, at the bright because I'll have to go look it up at home because I've got that on one of my legacy machines. I'll, I'll show you where that website is. And you can store your stuff there and change it and update it? As no, this is not to hold your stuff in. Rather, it's for you to print out pages oh. that you can then put into your binder and be able to write it. Oh, no, I, I like to print it, have the stuff printed, you know, all, okay. all in file, and then I update it. You know, every year. Okay, now let me think. So I didn't know a file maker. Are they uh, still I, I would suggest just scanning an empty one and turning it into a PDF form by putting in, you know, blank fill in sections into those forms that you want and then keep that as a template file. And then every time you want to create a new page, fill out the, the forms, print it out, and you've got your page. Okay, so you've got a program that you're running on a Mac? No. It's on a PC. Yeah, it's on. I didn't have, have the old PC just. Yeah. Every year yeah. use that for this particular thing. Yeah, you're talking about it's, it's got a lot of old machines and kids yeah. around for one program. Yeah. Okay. And that's what you use. You put in your information and then you print yeah. out from there. Yeah. It's okay. Difficult. Okay. Um, but weren't you. Looking at running parallels or virtual box to run your PC stuff on your Mac? Huh. No, I haven't. I remember the program Because that might be another way to do it. Basically, yeah. you take that same program, but you're running it, but, but you're running it under what on the PC? Under Windows XP? Um, Windows 7? Yeah, Win uh, XP. Is Windows that? XP. Okay. So what you do is. You download VirtualBox, okay. You uh, you install Windows XP into a virtual machine in Windows uh, VirtualBox, and then you install that program into that virtual machine, and you have it running on your Mac. And when you want to print, it uses whatever printers your Mac has available to it. Okay. Okay. I know this is a little complicated. It's a little complex. It's actually simpler in implementation. Okay, I remember so. you had a, a program on the yeah. virtu virtual thing. There's, a, there's also a program you can download which will run Windows XP. I mean, it is basically Windows XP in a, in a, uh, uh, a Java app, um, which violates all sorts of copyright laws. I, I'm surprised it's still up there, but it is. Anyway, and on that thing, you can install programs into it. And then when you turn the program off, you turn it back on, your program is still in. I don't recommend that because it's it's illegal. But no. <laughs> okay, download virtual box. Yeah. And then and then basically you're you're installing Windows XP in virtual box. It's a virtual machine. I'll have to figure out how to do that. They still have good beer out in Yellow Springs. Oh yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe maybe you can lure me out there. Okay. <laughs> I've been out there in so long, my the people that I was supporting uh, all moved on to other locations. So I'm in the Yellow Springs in a good year and a half, two years. Yeah, you come see me. Okay. We're, you're on uh, Oak Street? Winter Street. Winter Street. Yeah, it's right near downtown. Okay, it's before you get to the campus. Oh, no, you come in on, on Bank Street. Where is it in relationship to the Winds Cafe? Uh, about two blocks. Oh. oh, okay. I can go yeah. get lunch and then I can walk over. That's oh. right. Okay. Oh. All right. Look, send me an email to remind me. Okay. okay. I got. I got to check with my wife on the schedule. Okay. Uh, we. Uh, a piece of news I didn't. I forgot to mention that it is uh, Washington Centerville Washington Township Public Library. Washington Township Centerville Public Library. Woodburn is almost complete. They're going to be reopening in September. If I remember, it's like the end of September, September 20th, 23rd. There's a, a gala for people with deep pockets and long arms. It's going to be before that. And my wife is involved in the whole thing. So I sort of, you know, get given 
chores to do things. So I've got to check in with the boss later before I can commit them. But you know, Yellow Springs always a good place to visit. Oh yeah, yeah. Unless the bikers are in town. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Always coming to Yellow Spring days, and I go. Yeah, I noticed the same thing when I was in Neatmeyer out in Colorado. They were having their art festival day, and there were bikers coming in from like 20 of the states. I mean, it's like no parking, all the bikers. Yeah, they just love art. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, going right along. Anybody else would help desk? Uh, this is a, probably a pretty simple one. I just got a new MacBook Pro and all the print is very, very small and I was looking in preferences to try to find a way to get a all little bit larger print. Your desktop that, is very, on your very desktop, small. Yeah, when you bring up uh, the MacBook hard drive with all the applications, okay. it's small print. How do you make that bigger? I know, get stronger glasses. <laughs> okay, first thing is get on your desktop. I'm on my desktop. Click on one of the things that's on your desktop, but don't double click it. Don't click on the, uh, oh, the, the hard yeah, just drive? just have what? One of the things that's on your desktop. Like the hard drive? Selected. Then go down, go to your view menu on the menu bar, yep. and go down to where it says view options. Show view options? Yeah. Okay. Ah. Uh, so you've got a couple of things you can be doing here. One is you can change the icon size. So I've got mine set for 60 by 60. That's where mine's at. And you can make it go as big as 128. So see how the icons just became real big? And yeah. then the other thing you can do is in here where it says text size. I have mine set for 16 point text. Ah. Mine's on 12. No, yeah. no wonder. You I'm might want to try something larger than 12. Yeah, I try 16. See yeah. how that works. <laughs> Thanks. Now, conversely, now remember, for every good thing we can do, we can do evil. Okay. So That's if better. somebody you really don't like, what That's you better. do is you crank it down to nine point size, <laughs> and you make the icons instead of 128 by 128, you make them so that they're. <laughs> You know, like that, okay? And if you're really nasty, you'll like by accident drag a whole bunch of stuff on their desktop so it's like covered. Okay, okay. thank you. And you know, Elton, yep. that actually, that's the first time I can remember you bringing up something where it actually was a relatively simple thing that I did. That's <laughs> 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 good, that's good. Every now and then I'm a simpleton. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> but you know, it's these sorts of things that oh, yeah. that have the most impact on you. Because what part of your computer are you using the most? And that is the screen. So if you've got the screen set up where it's easily visible for you, it's not confusing, you know, that's a good thing to have. All right. And let's get back to agenda here. Um, this is specific to the desktop. Okay. The other stuff would be globally, all the folders, all the different windows. If you've got your documents folder open, etc. Thank you. I'll show you another neat little trick, though. Okay. Let me just get this out of the way. Let's say you've got something like a downloads folder. Okay, so here we go. Oh, come on. Okay, so here we got downloads folder. Okay, and it's an icon view. Downloads folder. That's the number one place where you're going to have club. <laughs> you download stuff, you're, you're installing a program, and you forget to throw away the DMG file. Or if you're like me, an impatient over 65, it's like I don't have much of my life left, I want that file now. You'll click on something to download it, you think it's not doing anything, so you click a couple more times. Yeah. <laughs> so you end up with four or five times. And the way you can tell if you've done that is when you look in the downloads folder, you'll have the name of the file, so you know abcfile.pdf, and then you'll have abcfile1, 
.pdf, two .pdf, three .pdf. So those are all copies of that. Well, one of the, the tricks that I use to keep myself organized is instead of just having it in an icon view like that, right over here we've got this little widget that's between the gear and your uh, cover flow icon where I can say how to keep this organized. So it's organized by date added. That means when did that file come into that download folder? <clears throat> so when I'm looking at this stuff in a list view, it's going to show me the stuff that was, oh, see, stuff I downloaded in May. Hey, I could probably get rid of that stuff. Stuff that I downloaded in June, and then stuff that I downloaded in the previous 30 days. And if it's newer than 30 days, it'll be stuff you downloaded today, last week, week before. Because guess what? We download all sorts of stuff and we forget why or who or when. So that's a way that you can keep it organized without having to do anything other than select one little thing. So the other choices are you can have it by organized by size, by tags, uh, the data was modified, the date you last opened it. I like to do that for a lot of my document files. So I'll have like a, a finance file where I've got all these spreadsheets where I keep track of stuff. Well, you want to open up the thing you were last working on, but you don't remember what it was. If you've got it organized by date last open, that thing you last open is going to be at the top. You're laughing, but hey, come on, this is real world, <laughs> real world stuff. Okay, so let's get back to agenda real quick. Okay, so any other help? That, yes, Mr. Ward. Yeah, I've got a mask on my laptop, and recently the uh, VPN keeps popping up with fan not turned on and I actually do want to have a, a VPN to use what's the best VPN okay there's different types of VPN okay the VPN from a bass you end up paying for okay and everything you're doing is routing through their server okay which may or may not be a good thing if you want to be doing true VPN where your computer is going to have a virtual tunnel set up to another computer. You don't want to be using the stuff that Avast has or the VPN that's built into Opera. There, you have to manually set up a VPN tunnel between the two machines. Because you have to have administrative rights on both machines to be able to set up that tunnel. Most people don't need that. All they need is just to have a more anonymous uh, uh, internet browsing experience. I'm wanting something basically for what I'm traveling. Opera. There's a browser called Opera. O-P-E-R-A is from okay. Scandinavia. They have VPN built into it. OP. Okay. Opera. You know, like the fat lady has okay. to sing. Okay. Hold on Let me see if I've got it. It's not over to a fat lady sing. <laughs> Here. Okay, I have Opera installed on my computer. This is the interface for Opera. It's a web browser. The key to doing VPN with Opera is you need to go to where it says Preferences. And when you get in there, and let me just give a little editorial comment. All of the web browsers, Google Chrome, Firefox, Safari, all of these things have got so many whiz bangs in them now that if you go looking for the setting, it'll take you at least 15, 20 minutes. So what they've done is they put a search engine for settings. So instead of rummaging through looking for it, you just put in what you're looking for. In this case, it would be a VPN setting. So in the search box, I am typing VPN. Then it goes through the and I'm not kidding, over 200 settings, shows you the one, and there's a little box, I click there, it says enable VPN, 
So now this web browser will allow you to do virtual private networking. A real world reason to do VPN. I really, yes, go ahead. VPN's no good if the guy on the other end is not VPNing also, right? That's not how VPN works. Let me explain. Okay. Let's say I'm cheap and I want to watch, or let's say I want to listen to British radio, BBC radio. And the BBC says, oh no, no radio for you. You're in North America. You have to be in the UK. Well, if I've got Opera and VPN set up, I can go to a British, you know, uh, VPN portal. Let me see if I can go in here. Da da da. VPN on. Optimum location is what it's set for. I'm going to set it for Europe. Okay. So what happens is when I do a search or I do a connection. It's connecting to a VPN server that Opera operates that's in Europe. It's in the Eurozone. <coughs> so it's like when I go to listen to BBC Radio 4, I want to keep track of my relatives in Leicestershire. Okay. It goes, oh, you're in the Eurozone. You're allowed to listen to BBC Radio 4. Okay. Let's say I want to watch The National in Canada, you know, their, their big broadcast. Instead of setting it for Europe, I'd set it for the Americas. And sometimes with some VPNs, you can actually specify you want to be popping out in Montreal or you want to be popping out in. So as far as the people on the other end are concerned, I'm on a computer that's in North America, or I'm in Europe, or I'm in Asia. My computer has a virtual private network going to that VPN server, which then pops out in that location. So it's like you're a gopher going through the hole and they pop up. <laughs> Are there any disadvantages to use an opera with a permanently set VPN? <clears throat> Not that I've found so far, especially since it's free and it's anonymized. And it's what? It's anonymized. In other words, they don't keep records where other VPNs do keep records. Okay? But this is the way I would suggest that you go if you just occasionally want to do a, a VPN. How do you get to that little window? Okay. One, you have to have Opera installed. Two, you go to settings. Three, you type into the little shirts search box, VPN. They'll show you where to turn it on. How did you get to your little window I got behind? Okay. Let me let me just move this up over here. Dun, dun, dun. VPN is in advanced under settings. Yeah. Go to preferences. preferences. Once you're in preferences, go to the little search box and just search. plug in VPN. And then it will show you what options it has regarding a VPN. I got there. So then what you want to do is you want to just check this little guy, yeah. enable VPN. <coughs> and then you end up with a little blue square in your search bar ah. where you can you click now, on that. The other thing is if you're doing a search, VPN is bypassed. So if you're doing a Google search and you've got VPN turned on in Opera, Google knows where you are, Google knows what you're searching for, and Google's keeping a record of it, and we all know who they are going to tell. Okay. So what I do is the other thing to maintain a, a more anonymous profile with my web browsing is I don't use Google as my search engine. I don't use Yahoo, I don't use AOL, I use DuckDuckGo. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I do that for two reasons. One, DuckDuckGo is an anonymous search. They don't keep records of what you were looking for. And the other thing is if I search using DuckDuckGo, it then asks the other search engines what, 
what, what they have for that. So you're actually searching using many search engines for one search. Okay. So I'll close that out and come back to agenda real quick. Okay. Any other help desk items? Well, can I back up just sure. for this? Dunk, which I use the dunk, dunk, go. Yeah. Do you, actually, if you use that, do you need the VPN? Um, if you already use the Unless you're doing something specialized like I was doing, like I want to watch Canadian television, oh, see, but yeah. it's only for Canadian, uh -huh. you know, inside the, uh, no, you don't need the VPN unless you're doing that kind of stuff. I see, okay. But DuckDuckGo is just, it's a better way to go. It, it less advertisements on it. Yeah. Um, you get better results, and um, it's just a better way to go. Yeah, I like it. Okay. I get tired of people collecting information. Because I do really weird searches. <laughs> really weird searches. Bill? Yes? With DuckDuckGo, can you get a little icon on your dock for DuckDuckGo? Yes. Yeah, you can. Um, where, where I mainly recommend is that uh, DuckDuckGo is on the, uh, the pads, the tablets, because there's an actual app they have from the app store called DuckDuckGo for the tablets. Okay. And then I use that as my, whenever I'm searching, I always use that little little thing. Uh, the tablet is just called DuckDuckGo, the app is? Yeah, you go to the Apple App store, you type in DuckDuckGo, most spaces. For things like this. Yeah. And for phones. And for phones. And for phones. Okay, all right. I am DuckDuckGo on the Chrome version. Yeah. 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 Okay. Can you do it that way, too? Sure. Yeah. It's a search engine. If you're basically, what you're doing is you're telling your, your web browser what search engines it should use. Okay. So, example here, and I know Rick is, is going to be upset with me because I'm burning up his presentation time, but here's an example. Okay, so I just launched Google Chrome, all right, and I've already got settings coming up and it's going to update. So here's that search bar to search settings. So I'm going to put in search, S-E-A-R-C-H. And that's for it to show me where all the search settings are. Mm -hmm. So I just type that in, search, and it says, oh, search engines. Okay. So over here it says my default search engine is something called Swagbox, which I'm not sure why that is. And if I come in here, Okay, DuckDuckGo is not one of my choices. I've got Google, I've got Yahoo, I've got Bing, I've got Ask, I've got AOL. So we come in here where it says Manage Search Engines. And one of them is right there, DuckDuckGo. So I would say, hey, make that my default. Now, if I do a search in Google Chrome, the browser, it's going to use DuckDuckGo as the search. What if you're using a different browser, like, you know, like Safari? You want Safari, to you go to preferences. Yeah. You go to your settings preferences. On, on Safari. Yep. Now there, they, you know, Apple does it in their own ways. <laughs> so let me get Safari launched. Let me go to Safari. Let me go to preferences. So there we got a thing that's called search. You click on that, and then it's got a box here where it says, what search engine do you want to use? You click on the little arrow next to it, and it pops up and gives you your choices. OK, so it'll always go to that when you're using Safari. Yeah. Yeah. OK. And if you got Firefox, you can tell it to use DuckDuckGo. I see Google pop up a lot, but it's not yeah. using Google if you're doing yeah. the search. Yeah. Now remember, them. when we change search engines, we're messing with people's money. Because if you use Google as your search engine, all those ads that show up on the side, that's money in Google's pocket. If we use the AOL search engine, those ads that show up, that's money in AOL's pocket. If we are using a Yahoo search engine, all those ads that show up, that's advertisement money going to Yahoo. Okay. 
So now you know why Apple is the only one of the male clients that doesn't seem to have all those advertisements on it. And eventually they'll figure it out and we'll start looking at it. Everybody else, if I'm running Outlook, there's ads. If I'm running uh, Google Gmail, there's ads. If I'm running Yahoo, there's Buku ads. If I'm running AOL mail, there's Buku ads. It's all about the money. Okay. So I think we're done. Time for a raffle, do you think? Unless somebody else has got a burning help desk question. Time for a raffle. I'm saying raffle. <laughs> So we'll get started. I uh, hope I'm not too fuzzy. I'll try not to be. Can you hear me? Oh, I just set the bottle right in front of the thing. <laughs> that was pretty slick. So uh, welcome. Today we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about iWork. Wow. And uh, we'll try to cover iWork in a little bit of depth. I want to talk to you a little bit about why you should use iWork, what you should know about iWork. Um, I like iWork a lot, so we'll talk about that. Bill in the past has talked about it. I'm not going to cover any of that material we talked about in the past. My primary objective today is to tell you what's new. What has changed recently in iWork, what's coming down the pipe, and why you should care. So I'll try to do that today. The presentation will be available afterwards. It will be me mailing it out. So feel free to contact me if you have any follow-up questions. So we'll go from there. So the first reason you should know about iWork is because you probably can get it for free. If you've recently bought an Apple device, or if you've ever bought an Apple device, you should be able to download it for free and use it. And it does everything that you would ever want to do. You have spreadsheets. You have documents you can edit and make really beautiful documents. And you can make, use numbers to make spreadsheets, and then you can use Keynote, which is what I use to make this presentation. Keynote is by far my favorite <coughs> for making presentations. I use it all the time, even when I don't have a presentation. I really love it. So we'll talk about that a little bit. And uh, first, the perspective. My son texted me this, this photo from uh, Indianapolis the day before yesterday. He was with, his, with my granddaughters. They were over at the Children's Museum. Mm -hmm. And he sends me this, and he sends me this text message that says, man, I remember this clock being way bigger. <laughs> and I sent him back and there, son, when you went, you were about the size of your daughter, and it probably did look a lot bigger. Yeah. It's all about perspective. And I think that's what we're gonna learn today in talking about iWork. There's a lot of things about perspective. A lot of the new changes in iWork go from working the way we've done things in the past to working in a very collaborative environment. And to do that, they use a lot of cloud, that cloud tools, which makes a lot of people very nervous, which is a lot of perspective change. So I'm going to introduce the ideas today. I don't expect you to adopt them, but I want you to be aware that they're there and know what they are and how they work in some generalities. But uh, I don't expect you to feel necessarily real comfortable with them. So, uh, so we'll do what we can and see how everybody feels about it. So what's new? The first thing is the area of collaboration. One of the big moves that I work is to try to take it to a tool, a set of tools that allow you to collaborate with teams and work with teams to develop whatever it is you're working on. Pages, numbers, or work or uh, key data. So let's say, for example, that I was working on the presentation for this, uh, for this meeting today, and there were three or four of us working on it. One of the things that the new collaboration tools allows us to do is for all the members of my team to be seeing and sharing that same document. Now the way they do that is, rather than us emailing that document back and forth and sharing it with email, it's shared over to iCloud, and we can all open it and edit it and then put it back, and the next person can open it, edit, put it back. And that was the very first step in collaboration with iWorks, yes? Can two people be working on it at the same time? Yes. That's in the next slide. Yes, they can. And that was one of the big moves that we'll talk about in a minute. But the first step was just to allow, how do we share it? And once you share the document, the person looks in their file, they see it, they can see who last edited it, they can make changes, they put it back, and the next person can. So that was the first step. The next thing they did with iWork 
that was a big move uh, after collaboration. This was announced this spring. Was they brought Apple Pencil into iWork. Now you might say, "Well, I thought you could already use the Apple Pencil." Well, if you're on an iPad, Apple Pencil is a very powerful tool. So one of the things they added this year to iWork to the whole suite is the ability to use the the pencil to make markups on a spreadsheet or on a presentation, and it sticks and it moves with the text. So as the text moves around on the document, your markups follow that move around. So you can see, if you were a teacher or somebody that was editing another document created by somebody else, that would be a really handy thing. It's like working on a piece of paper now. So if you're using an iPad and you, you use an iPad with an Apple Pencil to mark up documents, this is really powerful. So that was a big change. You can modify the document with your Apple Pencil. You can move things around, but you can mark it up and it sticks. It stays there and it follows the document around until somebody actually deletes it and cleans it up. So that was a big change. And uh, that was announced. In addition to this, they also announced a new pencil made by Logitech. And uh, it cost about half what the Apple Pencil cost. And they just made that available to the general public yesterday. It was also a pretty big surprise to me. Now this Apple Pencil only works with a smaller, lower cost iPad. I'm not here to sell anything. But the smaller, cheaper, or what they call the education iPad, remember the price was <coughs> like $2.99 or $3.99? It's the lower cost one. That works with this Apple Pencil. It's called the Crayon. Interesting name. And uh, they, they're selling that to the general public starting today or tomorrow. It's sometime here in the next couple of days. So it looks a little different, but it's really cool and it saves some money if, you're, if you buy that iPad. Just thought I'd mention that. So back to the collaboration thing. One of the other big things, and this, this was mentioned a minute ago, is in addition to sharing the documents and editing the documents in that way, you can also share a document and edit live. So let's say, for example, that five or six of us are working on a presentation. And we're all we're spent, we're scattered all over the place. I'm in China, somebody else is in England, somebody else is in the US. I don't it doesn't matter where you're at. We can all be working on that document at the exact same time, making changes, and as the changes are made, the other people will see the change and um, it works. I've, I've tried it. Now I don't think it's as fast as how Google does it. In the past I've used Google Docs. How many of you ever used Google Docs? In the past I've used Google Docs. And Google Docs says it's the exact same thing. And it's, so it's eerie how fast it responds. And multiple people can be working. And you can see changes that people are making. The first time I used that, I was in a meeting. And I was conducting the meeting. I was responsible for the meeting. And I'm looking at the document. And I'm, we're talking our way through this document. And all of a sudden, things start changing. I forgot that people could be editing it. And I see this little initials of somebody's name by a change of and this stuff all happened in front of me. It kind of freaked me out. <laughs> but this now works with the suite, with all of our work. And people can edit live. And so you can have your team, wherever they're at, be editing live, and you can be live, and all this happens at the same time while you're actually working on the document. Yes? Do you have a question? Somebody have a question? Um, if you've got two people working and trying to edit the same thing, who's got priority? Well, typically what happens, I don't know what happens exactly. I can't answer that question specifically. I just know that it, it happens. Most of the time when I've done it, people are on different parts of the document or you're somehow communicating live while you're editing. So it, I've never had that happen. But I'm sure that that happens and there's some way that it prioritizes and I don't know how it does that. I'll have to look at it. But it does, I'm sure. Rick, yeah. what if somebody makes changes but you don't want the change. Uh, how do you get back to where you were? Can you always you go back? You can do what I do. You can do what I do and go back to the previous time. Okay. But yeah, you know, the thing is, with collaboration, you tend to work with people that you trust, and you're working through things that you're working together on, so you know what's happening. I've, I've never worked with a group of people that I didn't have a lot of confidence that the changes they made weren't the right thing. I have had to go back and undo something because we decided we wanted to go another way. But that's just what you do if you were working with paper, too. So, uh, but it works, and it's great for collaboration. And uh, so Mark, don't undo you can it. have a list of collaborators on the side, and you can pick which collaborator you want to see what they're doing. So you can actually see what they're editing, which helps with some of this issue. But uh, 
I've tried this a couple, three times. Uh, it works. It's not as fast, though, like I said, as Google Docs. It's just not as fast yet. At least it wasn't the last time I used it. I haven't used it in a few weeks, probably a few months now. But it does work uh, pretty, pretty, pretty cool. Any other questions on that before I move on? And this gets more into what we were talking about. Now, one of the big things with using the cloud, and I wanted to mention this, because this uses iCloud as the primary option, you can also use Box. Not Dropbox, but there's another service called Box, box.com. And it's also a cloud service. And if you're uncomfortable with iCloud, you have another option. You can use all your documents in Box. So you have multiple choices, but it still takes a, a cloud service. So it's still requires that you're comfortable with the cloud to use this feature. And you can use that uh, anywhere on any source. OK, this is my favorite part and why I love to use uh, iWork. You can use iWork on anything that's a Mac or iPad or iPhone to edit your documents. And it doesn't matter. It works the same. It behaves the same. Uh, what year was it that they did the big iWork rework where they messed everything up and everything kind of fell apart? I don't remember. But since then, they've been rebuilding iWork and kind of making it more robust again. So a lot of those features. 2009. It was terrible. It was a, it was a, it was a disastrous year. They kind of built all that back up. So now all the services work pretty well, uh, but they work on everything. So if you if you want to work on it for a while on your iPad because you're on the road and you come home and you want to work out on your Mac, you pull it up and you just work on it wherever you're at, and it's the exact same file. And the way that works is, again, through the cloud. But this is a big, big change in the way we work, and the way we think about editing files. And uh, so any Apple device, right? Yeah, right. You could, you could, you could pull up, uh, there's a web version of iWork. So you can edit that on a PC. You could log in and actually work on it. So I've done that. I've, I've logged in on a non so the web client will allow you to do it too. I find the web client a little bit slow and a little sluggish, but if you log it in, you can log in and actually work from there. So that works really well. Rick? Yes? When, if you, say you've got a document that you personally are working on, whether it's an iPad or iMac or whatever, um, and then you've got another um, document that you've got other people allowed to work how do you distinguish between whether they can get into your, is there a password or something? There's a little, like you can do a password. You can set a password on all your documents. Oh, okay. okay. And that's a coming slide. So you can put passwords on documents if you want. Mm -hmm. But you can also tell by looking at them. Uh, it tells it's shared with, it says it right on the screen, who, how many people you share with, that kind of information. Oh, okay. So you can see and recognize what you've shared in collaboration versus mm -hmm. what you're doing yourself. Plus, some files you may only store locally. You may not be comfortable putting some documents in the cloud. So you may have some documents you store locally. So you can store locally or you can store in the cloud. You just can't use all the sharing features on something that you store locally in the same way. OK, this is a, a, the, one of the last big changes I'm going to talk about. Then there's a whole bunch of litany of small ones I'm going to mention. This year, when you get iOS 12 and when you get uh, Mojave, you're going to see that iBooks has been renamed. And like all of Apple's latest changes in names, they just call it Books. Yes, Books. It's really original. <laughs> <laughs> so this one's going to be called Books. It's still right now if you're on iOS 11 or you know whatever, it's still called iBooks. But, but I'm on the beta for iOS 12 and it already says Books and it just drives me crazy. But it's going to be called Books. However, the big news here is that you can, you know, has anybody ever created an iBook using the old tool for editing iBooks? I forget what that was called. Did you create one? Yeah. It was a nasty tool. It wasn't that great, but it worked. And you could create your own iBook, and you could sell it. And you could put an iBook on the market. You could put it in the iBook library, and people could buy it, download it, or you could give it away for free. Um, that works. It was really cool. But what they've done now, starting this year, they're starting to migrate to using pages to create these books. So you can create, there's a bunch of templates you can create. We could have a separate lesson on just this. You can create 
an iBook in pages, and then you can uh, upload it to iBooks or to books, whatever you want to call it, and sell it or give it away or whatever. But that all happens inside pages now. And uh, the pages templates aren't as powerful in some ways as the templates were in the old iBook app, but they're still very good, very functional. I've done a couple of small examples. I've played with it, and I really like the way it works compared to using the special app. And I like it that it's pages, which I already really well understand. So, uh, so if you want to write a book, anybody who wants to write a book, this would be a great way to think about writing your book. Uh, you can also, of course, export from the tool in pages. You can export it as an EPUB book, so you can sell it other places or generate, you know, places you can send it up outside of the, the iBook store. You have to be careful with that and make sure you understand what the Apple requirements are, but you can do that. I like to use it to put photographs in because I can take and make a photograph book, a montage of photographs, and make those into an iBook and make it available to the family and stuff like that. So that's what I've been playing with. Oh, but, but can I use, so when you, you make it in pages, I use pages a lot. So you make your book in pages, and then you export to book? Or you book? have to use one of the templates. There's special templates you have to use. Okay, yeah. so, I use so you use those templates. templates. Then you can export it as an iBook and upload it to iBooks or send it to people. Okay, so if you want to print, because I've been wanting to do this with photos. So, but I make it in pages, but I have to go out to books in order to print it and get it ready. No, you don't have to go out to, you can do it right from your I could just you can write pages. Send you wouldn't have to send it anywhere. You could do it yourself. Okay. That's a great tool for this. So look at the... Look at the templates. They're already there in the latest version. So if you have 4.1 or whatever it is right now. So I'm just trying to understand if I want to print the book. And you can print it just like you print for print pages. Print off my Yeah. Thank you. But if you use, you know, you don't even have to use the iBooks templates to do just the print. But the iBook template allows you to get in the right format and do all this special stuff that books can do in iBooks. So why would I go from pages to iBooks to a book? When you do the template at the end, uh, there's a place you click. I don't remember where it's the exact I can show you. Yeah. You click that, and you just say, send it to iBooks, and it publishes it. It's like publishing on the web. It's kind of like OK, that. so you can't publish on the web from pages the same way. I'm trying to figure out why would I bother with books if I have already have it. Well, there's a, there's a tool out there. If you wrote a book, yeah. let's say you wrote a book about uh, I'll just ask a photo book. Okay, we're, we're going to learn on birds, which is my favorite topic. So I got this big book of birds, and I want to make it available for people all across the world to be able to look at my pictures of birds. So Apple has got this great vehicle for advertising those things. So if I put it in there, if I put it in the iBooks library, okay. now people can search. Somebody writes in there searching for something about birds, my book will come up. And so people can find it. It's a distribution tool a way to allow people to find my book on birds. So if but I, I, I can't do that myself. I can't just publish it. So if I, I wanted to send it to my family, I could just send it in pages. Yeah. But if you want to send it, you want people all over the world to look at your pictures of birds, which I'd love to have happen, yeah, then you make a bird book. I, thank you. I'm sorry. I just tried to, I've been wanting to do this. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. It's a great tool. You say you can put that into what? To in the iBooks library. Yeah, it's iBooks like a book yeah. It's just like, it's just like Amazon's bookstore, but it's yeah. it's ran by Apple instead. And I, I buy a lot of books on the Apple bookstore, and they go into books, and I read them there in my, on my iPad. You can put books of your own in that same place, that same library. Are you going to demonstrate somewhere in your presentation how to go from pages and put it into iBooks? I didn't plan on doing that today because it's kind of a separate topic. I just want to introduce the idea this is a new feature it's in pages now. And if it's a popular topic, I'd be glad to set up a presentation. Sounds like it is from the discussion like we'll, in we'll my list you, of something. You said that the templates for iBooks was already in pages. Is it I'm page? not finding it. Are you on the latest version? I hope so. We'll look afterwards, I'll show you. It's there. You do file new and then look down the list. It's there for books and I can show you. When we're done, we'll look at that. Ah. Find it? Yeah. Good. I was looking at base. There's several different <coughs> versions. There's a portrait and landscape. I would do a little reading online about how to do that before you take off. Uh, there's been a lot talked about. People that have been using this, <coughs> including like Max Sparky. So if you go to maxsparky.com, he's talked about it. And uh, it's, worth, it's worth studying a little bit. But it works. I've done it. 
I just start playing. You can't hurt anything. If you don't like it, you just start over. Anything else on books? Books seem to be popular. I didn't expect that. So can you lock down rights that people have? Yeah. Like you can't copy it, you can't print from it. You do that real well in books because they, you know, you, they can't do anything with it other than read it online if you keep up with this thing. But you can you have some ability to protect that. It's just standard capability with the I mean, watermarking or you can put that on it when you lay it out. You could add watermarks to the thing. I don't know if it would add them when it's printed, but I know you can add it to the mark of the thing. So you can add copyright notices and things like that right in the book. It's really good. Anything else? Before we leave books, we're doing really good. We're ahead of schedule. All right. Now, the last one on this list, I think, completely, just real quick. You can protect documents so that only you have access. I wouldn't expect anything less from Apple with their current state of thinking about privacy. But you can make it so that you have to use a password or, or you can use your face or you can use your thumb if you know what kind of device you're working on. So you log in to actually have access to documents. So you can add security features to a document so that only you have access. And we're not going to get into how secure or not secure that is, but that's available lock documents down and uh, <coughs> make sure that only you're the person that's editing that document. It, it really works. Okay, and the rest. Now I'm going to get to the long list. And I'm not going to highlight these, but I'm going to highlight a couple of them. And uh, so there's three pages of these and then we'll be done. So we're a little ahead of schedule. So this is all of the other enhancements that came to pages this year. And uh, a couple that I wanted to mention was um, they tried to do a better job with adding the capability to do things with shapes and how you edit shapes. They tried to do some things with how, how you browse templates by category instead of just looking through that long list like you had to do in the past. Uh, tracking changes, they just work on the tracking capabilities. So if you use tracking, writing a big document, it's 50 pages long and you're going to make some edits. You want to track those changes. You've seen how Word does that, I'm sure. They've added some more robust tracking capabilities. They've improved that a little bit. Um, this, this annotating versus drawing mode, I'm not going to get into that today, but especially with the pencil, they really did a lot of work to bring an Apple Pencil so that you can annotate or you can draw and recognize the difference. What is the difference between I'm drawing a circle and a happy face Versus I'm annotating, I'm putting a line through a document saying, strike this, put something else in. And it recognizes the difference between those things and actually treats those differently. And if you care, it has some extra improved support for Arabic computer, since they don't get along. <laughs> That's pages. Anything anybody wants to talk about pages, I'm not going to go deep here, but there, yeah. So I have a, have a question about about pages, so uh, this is a year or two ago when I was uh, creating some documents. And, uh, I these documents. Then I, I went and tried to go back in and change them and modify them, and it wouldn't allow me to do it. I couldn't figure out why. I don't know whether I just was missing something. I haven't seen that. For was some it, reason, maybe I it was just, a version change. It piece. wouldn't allow me to. Maybe it's just the way it makes the file in there. I don't know. Yeah, if you had saved it as read only or something, but you'd have to look at the specifics. I mean, yeah. if you have a file, you'd have to take a look at it. Oh, okay. It's got to be something like that. Other questions before we move on? Okay. I just, just to go back, in pages, I, that's primarily all I use in, in the um, iWorks is pages. And I know I've been confused a little bit out in red, and I think I'm getting straight. The difference between doing, say, a newsletter, which is what I do with it, in, with word processing versus doing it, uh, what do they call the other mode? Yeah, I, this is a circus. I do not understand this either. It's a, uh, it's a, what's that other mode called? I can't think what the I other mode is this. called, graphic or something, but th you have to be very graphic careful processes. what you're in. Yeah. Thanks, get all my Most time. people are just going to create do word documents, word, word documents, that they just create documents to edit. But there is other modes of operation, and they haven't kind of done a good job of explaining. So moving photos around in those is what. Has we talked about this once. I remember this. Yeah. 
So you helped me. Yeah. And we did see it somewhere, but I don't remember this. I didn't know if other people had found that to be something they did lose in other yeah. I don't know. Anybody else have any issues there? That's not good for me. I'm sorry. Keynote, uh, Keynote again is my favorite tool for making presentations. I have used PowerPoint for years. I've used Keynote for years. I prefer Keynote by far over uh, PowerPoint. There's other ways of doing doing it now too. Um, the biggest change they made there was they kind of cleaned up and made charts and graphs look better. I really like the way they look. Uh, it's not massive change, but it's just a clean up and make them look better. And that has really improved that. Um, it, they added out the pencil support, just like the others. I have to admit, I never use a pencil with my iPad. When I'm making a presentation, it's just not the kind of thing I need a pencil for. I use it with pages, but I don't use it too much with Keynote. But it does work now, and it does the same things across the whole suite. But that's not something I use a lot. This is an interesting one that I haven't used yet that I really want to try. You can add audio directly into your keynote. So you can have audio, an audio clip right in your keyboard and play it. The way it used to do that was terrible. I mean, it was really hard to use. It doesn't do it very well. I didn't think it did it very well in PowerPoint either. But they've added that capability here and added support for adding these clips right into your, into your presentation. And I'm really anxious to try that. At least haven't had time to try it yet. Uh, as I, we were talking about in pages, I, I hope I'm not the only one in the room that would like to see more than just generic characteristics like of it, but how to do it. Yeah. Go yeah. through it. That, that bill, that might be something we'd we'll look at in the future to go we'll through pages and keynote and numbers. We're looking for new topics, so I'll put all these on the list. I'm more in depth in pages, more in depth in keynote, and more in depth in uh, right. iBooks. We'll add that to the list. We've got, a, we've got the next several, but we'll add that. Um, numbers. This is my least favorite tool in the whole suite, right? Because I'm still a big Excel guy. I have used Excel for years, and I'm so fluent with Excel that I can do things faster in Excel. And I find it a little hard to bring my wrap my, my mind around the way numbers does some things. But it works. I mean, I've used it, and it works. And I keep my. I have a. I have a. LLC is a small business that I do some work, and all my books and budgets are all done in numbers because I was going to force myself to learn to use it, and I actually use it. But uh, it's taken me a long time to get comfortable with it. Uh, but I like those same features we talked about earlier, the ability to do it across any device, and how it, how it works with my devices is what I really like about it. Um, the, the additions here are about the same. They added the pencil support and a few other little things. but. Uh, not too much to say about numbers. Anybody have any questions about numbers that specifics you want to ask about? What yeah. about, can you uh, download it to Excel? Yeah, you can. You can, can just like you can do with Word. You can export an Excel, or you can import an Excel file. Okay. Or a CDS file, or whatever you want. Okay. What if the Excel file has a lot of, um, what am I looking for, formulas yeah. in certain cells? My big problem with numbers is it couldn't accept the... Yeah. I do just have to try it. If you use some really advanced statistical or mathematical functions, you might get in trouble. But if you're using very basic summations and you know, general math and formulas, that's easy. But when you get into that some more advanced stuff, like if you're doing it for a fast Fourier transform, and you're trying to do that uh, stuff, and you know, then you might have a problem. I've not tried anything that complicated. But, uh, you know, the thing I ran into trouble when you get into really big spreadsheets, I had some issues, and uh, formulas was the other place I had some issues. So if you're using it for really, really complicated stuff, I'd probably use Excel. But if you're doing it for just general stuff, especially if you're going to make presentations with it, because it really creates great tools to create nice-looking documents that I can import into pages or I can use as is, it does a great job. It really, that's where it shines. I, in Excel, you can create a multi-page document with tabs yeah. for each one. How would you do that in numbers? You can create multiple tabs. Tab, you have multiple when tabs. When I tried it, they all came up on one big page, and I had to just go select pieces of that one huge page. 
in order to do it. Yeah, I haven't had that happen. I'll have to try that. Maybe we can email, we can send some files back and forth and try that. So send me an email. I'll be traveling the next few days, but I'd like to try that. Okay. I haven't seen that, but send me one that you're working with and we can go back and forth and see. I can do that. We can figure that out. See, my email's at the bottom of the file, so you can see. Does, does number still use the uh, big long names? Or has it gone back to the A, cell, calling a cell A1, B, C? I always use the cell numbers and letters. Still. Is there a way to shift from numbers into? I didn't know you could shift back and forth. Did you know that, Bill? Numbers, numbers you can shift the lab labels versus letters for cells on A1, one. I don't remember being. I don't use numbers that much because most of the stuff I'm doing is statistical. And it just, it doesn't. It's exactly what we're talking about. It just can't do it. Yeah, I, I don't, I haven't seen that, but I, I'll double check on that before we talk about that in the future. Any other questions on numbers? Because we're wrapping up here real fast. We're going to be done early today. I don't know if you want to be done early, but I have a beach calling my name, so I have to be there. <laughs> so uh, that's the end of the presentation. I thought there was one more slide, but there isn't. So, generally speaking, the, the idea here today was just to get you to think about, give it another chance. Get in and try it, play with it, don't do anything serious at first, because it's there, you already have it, it works great. Don't be afraid of using it with the cloud if you're trying to collaborate. If you're just doing it by yourself and you need to collaborate, you don't need to worry about that. <coughs> it works and it works great, and it's there, it's free. And it's a very advanced piece of software. I I'm, <laughs> didn't mean to interrupt you, but I will anyway. Um, <laughs> one of the problems I have, <clears throat> years ago I had someone that, in the family that could help with formulas. You know, we're talking mostly Excel. Uh, and I have taken what he did for me and m made it, moved it to other locations, but I don't fully understand the language. Uh, I got one where you concatenate and then so and yeah. so, and, and it has to go to other things. Where do I find, for dummies, <laughs> the, well, there's, a, you know, there's, a, there's probably an Excel for dummies. Probably. There are lots of books that deal with this topic. As well as classes. There are many, many classes. If you just Google online or go Google, you can talk about that. Okay. There are lots of classes that I can probably help direct you to some, but there are classes. You might even know some. The library offers a ton of classes. Yeah, it's got a public library. Yeah, but they <coughs> the, 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 the there's some they specific. have intermediate and advanced ones and ones just on formulas. Yeah. Oh. Are they yeah. online or are they they're at the public at library? The public. Yeah. yeah, they're really good. Yeah. They'll go in depth on that, yeah. real deep yeah. on how you exactly what you're looking for. What's uh, kind of surprising is my local right. library Washington Centerville Public Library, they, this year they're doing a thing called Tech Tuesdays in the evenings. Check their website. I think they've got one coming up on Excel formulas, just formulas. That's, That's exactly, exactly what, what you want. Now, where do I, what do I check? Go, go to the Washington Centerville Public Library website. Okay. WCPL.org. And the other one is Dayton Metro also has a ton of stuff. Yeah, the local libraries are very basic to the point where within a few months I was going back to show them how to do some things in yeah. publisher. You might find some stuff. <laughs> and I'm hacking my way through. That's why I recommended the Tech Tuesdays because yeah. they had outside speakers coming in. Or just right. specialize in that. Yeah. You can also look at uh, even YouTube. If you search on oh, YouTube. Yeah. You can learn anything on YouTube. You can learn how to do everything in the world on YouTube. And they're really good sometimes. It's just, it's just a play with it. I mean, you can't lose anything but a few minutes of your time. I just remember Linda.com is free for all Montgomery County residents now for the library. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. They have start great. September 1st, and that would have. Yeah, Linda would have a lot of great tools. And they would have all the skill levels yep. for you know, beginners through more advanced. You can take the classes and work your way up. What's it called? Something it's like that? Linda.com. Linda? Yeah, L-Y-N-D-A. L-Y-N-D-A.
And you they were acquired. Library. They were acquired. Go by to the library's website first. Who bought okay. it? Acquired by Microsoft or LinkedIn or somebody. LinkedIn. And then LinkedIn was acquired by Microsoft. That's great. That's a great tool. And I didn't know that Montgomery County residents got it for yeah, free. Just so if you can use that, that would be great for learning. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, library yeah. member. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You have to be a but county it's resident. Okay. It's free to be a member. And just go ahead. What was the website for the uh, for the uh, oh Bill was telling us for the Washington Township? What's the Washington Centerville? WC Library. WC. W. WC Library. WC Library.info. Slash education slash software to get the list of. You got that? Sure. Yes. Uh, a little quirk that I ran into with Keynote. Um, I was adding a animated GIF to a file. Now GIF format is, I don't know, what, 30 years old or something. But um, <clears throat> that's just the, the format that I ended up using. And uh, while it was able to import it in PowerPoint, it was not playing it as fast. It was like, like it defaulted to the speeds. Different, you know, frame rate. But when I brought it into Keynote, it was the perfect. But unfortunately, the, the, the place I was working with dictated it in PowerPoint. And so when I exported it, it looked real crap. When I last stopped in my career, it was all PowerPoint. And uh, so I had to use a lot of PowerPoint. But when I was doing presentations that just I was giving, I didn't have to share with anybody. I still did the keynote, I just didn't tell them. And I didn't uh, so I just didn't make a point. <coughs> so I did that a lot. But yeah, I don't use PowerPoint a lot. And a lot of times I would create them in keynote, then I would export them to PowerPoint. And then I would use them because I could do all the tools that I was really comfortable with in the entire keynote, and then I would export it to PowerPoint. Plus, you can use your watch as a the watch works through the remote. I did that a couple times. It freaked people out. That, uh, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Um, other questions or comments before we close down? Okay. Quick, but this is, yeah. How do I know if I've got the newest version of um, I worked down on my computer? If you're, if you're on, you, use the, you probably use it off the Mac Store. So if you just make sure you've updated the latest, the latest is going to be in the App Store. So if you go to the Mac App Store, find Pages, for example, it'll tell you what the latest version is. Okay. Or on your Mac, on your iPad, you yeah. can go to the Mac App Store, the App Store, Mac and the I iOS Apple App Store, App Store, and look there. It'll tell you. I was on the page that looked good ago, and it tells you what the version is right at the top. Thank you. But it should automatically update. I know. One other reason they have pages, keynote, and numbers on your Mac, even if you are an Office user. I can't tell you how many times I've gone to open an Excel spreadsheet or a Word doc or a PowerPoint presentation and my metadata has gone corrupt and I can't open it. What I've learned is I can open it in pages or keynote and numbers, get it so it's stable, and then save it back out in the yeah. office format. I so that. I can't tell you how many times I've saved a travel and entertainment spreadsheet because that's money out of my pocket, you know, that I had in, in Excel and it blew up and I open it in numbers, save it back out, and I'm good to go again. So the bottom line is if you, if you have had to use Microsoft Office and you want to escape that pain, this is a great preview. <laughs> so it works. Now there's things they can't do perfectly. There's, there's some limitations here and there. But for most of the things that I do anymore, these days. If you have any questions, my email is in the thing. You're welcome to call me, email me uh, anytime. If I don't know the answer, I'll say that for the answer, but I'll definitely try to answer any questions. So I really appreciate your time today. Next month, we'll talk about what we're going to be talking about. We don't know yet. Yep. We'll find out soon. After Wednesday, and we see what happens. What happens. I think. Very possible it's going to be really interesting. Yes.